Uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, let me start uh, by firstly apologizing for keeping you slightly longer than um, we have envisaged in terms of our starting time. My name is Lumkile Lalendle. I'm the um, program director for this session. And um, <clears throat> I want to uh, welcome you to the seventh um, principal and vice chancellor's African intellectual project. And uh, this is the final lecture for 2019. We have had a very interesting uh, sessions earlier on. And um, we have sa saved the best for the last. Therefore, I've got <clears throat> even two outstanding um, academics and intellectuals in South Africa and um, to actually um, do this seventh uh, lecture. But as we start our program, we plan to be out, out of here at one o'clock and um, that will be my measure of me having successfully <coughs> run this program. And um, I like um, at this moment to welcome the principal and the vice chancellor of the University of South Africa, Professor Mandla Makanya, who has uh, been an intellectual in his sense by making sure that he hosts these uh, groundbreaking uh, speakers for us. Therefore, Prof, uh, through your leadership, we really appreciate uh, the endeavors that you have done. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Lumgile Larendle, uh, our program director for today. As we all know, colleagues, that Prof. Larendle is an executive director of planning and quality assurance in the office of our vice principal responsible for strategy planning and assurance services. Let me welcome um, our colleagues who are with us from the side of executive and extended management, but at this point, I just want to recognize in our midst the members of our diplomatic corps um, who that I met just before we came in um, representing the Nordic countries. You are most welcome here. Thank you so much. But also our MMC from uh, the Swanee Metro, uh, Mr. Kissenduth, you are most welcome uh, here as well. We know that uh, with this program, we do have your support. Colleagues, I just want to welcome Professor Pumlakola, who is the Dean of Research from the University of Forte, and Professor Peggy Ngomezulu, who is the Deputy Dean of Research from the University of the Western Cape. Um, our participants who are here as well, um, from the side of uh, colleges, the departments, um, and also want to welcome the president of the National Student Representative Council and his team, who may be with us here this morning. I uh, already met him uh, earlier today. Let me welcome representatives of uh, national, provincial, and local government, guests from our sister institutions of higher uh, learning and research entities, members of the diplomatic or other of business community, our colleagues from the side of the university and stakeholders, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Tumelang, Moluin, Akshay, Jambu, Bonjo, now uh, Professor Zung is confessing that she does not know what is going on. <laughs> she says, I'm, I don't know. Akshay, uh, Luchan, Khoyamore, Colleagues, in contributing to today's lecture, I'm proposing to do just one thing very shortly to talk about the concept of intellectuals because this is what we're going to be exposing, exposing ourselves to uh, this morning. It is my view that a brief examination of the nature and role of intellectuals is going to help us to frame the reflections that are going to be following. The Dreyfus Fair affair, which unfolded in France at the end of the 20th century, and ended in 1906, involving the false accusation against Alfred Dreyfus for, for having passed um, on French military secrets to the Germans, 
is often cited as the modern beginnings of the complexity of the role of intellectuals in society. In fact, it is often claimed that the liberal connotations attached to the term intellectual was coined during that affair. That followed 1928 publication of Julian Bender's book, The Treason of Intellectuals, in which he criticized some of the educated people's betrayal of Dreyfus when he was faced with treason trial, their betrayal based on largely ethnicity and nationality. For Bender, the intellectuals during the Dreyfus affair betrayed what was supposed to be their calling, talking and standing by the truth. Instead, they allowed nationalistic sentiments and ethnic considerations because Dreyfus was Jewish to obscure their supposed objective judgment. Bender's conception of intellectuals seemed to revoke the Socratic understanding of how learned men and women must carry themselves in society. As a dispassionate group that sets itself apart in society, especially from the ruling elites, its only interest, which may set it in conflict with the rulers of the day, should only be to uphold, to propagate, and to defend the truth, relative as the truth may be. The dispassionate position of intellectuals, therefore, must be in relation to the ruling classes in society, and not so much to distance themselves from the ordinary members of society. So the conception of the intellectual, as it implied from Bender's criticism, was to be developed further in our times by Noam Chomsky and Edward Said. For Chomsky, writing in the New York Times Review of Books at the height of the Vietnam War, which he opposed, said the following, it is the responsibility of intellectuals to speak the truth and expose lies, unquote. In typical Chomskyan style, we are to tell various examples of how an array of intellectuals, including the brilliant but Hitler-supporting Martin Heidegger, failed to understand and to stand for the truth, but instead allow themselves to support what we refer to as officialdom. What Chomsky contributed to the debate around the role of intellectuals is the need of this class to take advantage of the freedom that they enjoy, which is associated with their location within universities and some of them within the media. And he argues in the following manner, quote, for a privileged minority, Western democracy provides leisure, the facilities, and the training to seek the truth lying hidden behind the veil of distortion and misrepresentation, ideology and class interest through which the events of current history are presented to us. The responsibility of intellectuals then are much deeper than what Dwight MacDonald calls the responsibility of people, given the unique privileges that intellectuals enjoy." Unquote. I'm noting major weaknesses in the scholarship of Chomsky in this case. His rooted beliefs in the virtues of the Western system of thinking of course, Chomsky, Chomsky is not alone in this. Cornel West is another progressive thinker and activist who is often unable under these circumstances to see beyond the virtues of Western scholarship. But I am I mean, digressing on this one for a simple reason that um, you will actually have to decipher yourself. Edward said, a Palestinian scholar, First, said talks about what the intellectual does in his or her vocation. And he writes this in the following words, quote, Intellect each intellectual, the book editor and the author, the military st strategist and the international lawyer, speaks and deals in a language that has become specialized and usable by other members of the same field. Specialized experts addressing other specialized experts in a lingua franca largely unintelligible to unspecialized people." Unquote. Second, said turns to the role of the intellectual, which he argues, quote, cannot be played without a sense of being someone whose place it is publicly to raise embarrassing questions, 
to confront orthodox, orthodoxy and dogma rather than to produce them, to be someone who cannot be easily co-opted by governments or corporations, and whose raison d'etre is to represent all those people and issues that are routinely forgotten or swept under the rug." Unquote. What is clear from both Chomsky and Said, following on Bender and going back to Socrates, is that intellectuals must essentially function out of and almost in isolation to the state. There will surely be many who will not agree with this view, arguing that it is possible to form part of the administration of the state and therefore bring critical and needed skills for the greater public good. It is here that Gramsci's distinction between organic intellectuals and revolutionary intellectuals becomes useful. The distinction that he asserts starts off by arguing that, quote, all men are intellectuals. One could therefore say, but not all men have in society the function of intellectuals, unquote. It should be clear thus far that irrespective of the perspective on, on intellectual life that one may choose, whether as an inter organic intellectual in the broader public service or as a revolutionary intellectual who prefers to distance themselves from the public service in order that she or he can speak truth to power, the role that one plays comes down to one thing. It's a choice that a person makes. So many intellectuals make choices on how they will play their intellectual roles. And such choices should not force us into binary thinking, no less than Karl Marx, whether we agree with his ideas or not. In his writing, as he was contemplating his own choices, writes something very interesting that I want to make reference to. Quote, one who chooses a profession he values highly will shudder at the idea of being unworthy of it. He will act nobly if only because his position in society is a noble one. But the chief guide which must direct us in the choice of a profession is the welfare of mankind and our perfection. It should not be thought that these two interests could be in conflict, that one will have to destroy the other. On the contrary, man's nature is constituted that he can attain his own perfection only by working for the perfection, for the good of his fellow men. If he works for himself, he may perhaps become famous of learning, or a famous man of learning, a great sage, an intellectual or an excellent poet. But he can never be a perfect, truly great man. History calls those men the greatest who have ennobled themselves by working for the common good. Experience acclaims as happy as the man who has made the greatest number of people happy. Religion itself teaches us that the idea, being whom all strive to copy, sacrificed himself for the sake of mankind. And who will dare to set and not such judgments? If we have chosen the position in life which we cannot or we can most of all work for mankind, no burdens can bow us down because they are sacrifices for the benefit of all. Then we shall experience no petty, limited, selfish joy, but our happiness will belong to millions, our deeds will live on quietly and perpetually at work, and over our ashes will be shed the hot tears of noble people." Unquote. It is this choice that W.E.B. Du Bois made when he became the first African-American to obtain a PhD from Harvard University in 1895. He could have chosen to be indifferent to the condition of his people. In fact, in his essay, The Concept of Race, Du Bois wrestles with his own identity and how he was viewed. Not dark enough, and from the north, where slavery was banned. The early generation of Africans who received their university education in Britain and the USA, such as Pixley Kaisaka Sene, DDT Jabafu, Alfred Mangan, Charlotte McLeague, and many others, 
chose to serve their people rather than enjoy the privileges of education for themselves. This generation was to be followed by the University of Fort Hay and our own UNESCO graduates, Anton Lembede, Robert Sobukwe, Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, and many more, the 1944 Youth League Group, who chose to serve people instead of following lucrative careers that awaited them. They were to be followed by the Black Consciousness Movement students of the late 1960s and 70s, who also chose to become revolutionary intellectuals, working for humankind, as Marx would put it. What is common among these intellectuals is that they face serious impediments in their own lives. From police harassment, through to detention, solitary confinement, life imprisonment, torture, exile, and even death. They were nonetheless prepared, as Bender argued, they were intellectuals to be burned at the stake. Compounding fear was the hallmark of many of the intellectuals who came before us. They succeeded to banish it. So as we gather today, we are all advised to reflect on the evolution of the intellectual work, from the frustrations expressed by Bernard through to the choices made by Du Bois, and the sacrifices made by many South African intellectuals. What we learn is that the choice of being an intellectual is often not an easy one. Moving from the challenges faced by intellectuals during the pre-1994 era, we realize that the place of the intellectual after the dawn of democracy is a complex one. One can identify four phases that intellectuals have had to negotiate since 1994. The first phase between 1994 and 1999, the years that corresponded with the Mandela presidency. These were the years of euphoria, but also years of confusion for the intellectual torn between the support for a new democratic government, which held the hopes of the people while trying to remain independent, as Socrates would have argued, was the key challenge for the intellectual during that period. But the second phase was during 1999 to 2008, or simply the Tabumbeg years. Two key features characterized this phase. The first was an intense debate around the role of black intellectuals with maybe challenging them to formulate original ideas and assist the country to find solutions. Sadly, the debates and the changes were often hostile, and they deprived the country of the opportunity to reflect on the true state of the nation over the years. Ionically, one of the best articulations of African Renaissance and its relevance for higher education transformation was produced during the same year. A book on the need to infuse the idea of African Renaissance into the discourse of higher education transformation, with the title Towards an African Identity of Higher Education was produced during the same period by none other than Professor C. Paul Siep. The third phase was during the years 2009 to 2018, or simply put, the Jacob Zuma presidency. An antagonistic relationship between the state and intellectuals developed. Black like intellectuals have to defend themselves against the derogatory label called clever blacks. Once again, this was a sad epoch that unfolded right here. And the fourth phase has emerged during the presidency of the current president, Ramaphosa, to date. It might be too early to articulate the nature of the relationship between the intellectuals and the current administration. What seems to be emerging, though, are two features. One, there is general support and appreciation for the administration, particularly as it is viewed as attempting to restore the functioning of the state. On the other hand, there seems to be growing frustration at what seems to be perceived as Ramaphosa's slowness to act decisively in eradicating or addressing this, some of the stubborn problems that are still facing the state. As these phases unfold, intellectuals might identify a role or roles for themselves. They must open spaces and insist on more spaces being open for the free expression of ideas that can help advance the nation. This should be so whether one identifies as an organic intellectual who is open to work within or with the public service or business. 
or whether one identifies as a revolutionary intellectual who chooses to remain independent of and at times critical of the state. So as Marx would say, all make choices for the service of humanity. It's my hope that what we're going to be experiencing today from Professor Kola and Professor Mgumizu will assist us to develop a deeper understanding of the challenges that are faced by the intellectuals in the African context, but also the impediments that are actually standing on our way as adults that are simply interfering with the Africanization agenda, as it were. So with these few words, I just want to say on behalf of our own council, our senate staff and students, that uh, colleagues, you are most welcome. We're looking forward to hearing from you. We know that uh, you've been up and about uh, with these piercing thoughts on critical matters that are closer to our hearts. And it's for that reason why we want you right here and right there. And we are looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Mr. <clears throat> Vice Chancellor, I would like to thank you for setting the context. And then, as I have started, I've said this is almost the final series of uh, <clears throat> this Vice Chancellor and African Intellectual Project uh, lecture series. But um, I've been asked to take you through memory lane so that you can see what were the issues that. Uh, we were dealing with in respect to the last six uh, lecture series so that uh, you can be able to integrate the information that you get today uh, and also to understand where we are planning to go with these things. Therefore, I'll ask those that are responsible for playing the video. It's a short one. We won't keep you the whole day here. It's about nine to ten minutes and then we'll be back into our program. Thank you, sir. powers to African women. 
The need for black women's voices to be differentiated even if they locate their struggle against capitalist patriarchy within the broader women's struggle cannot be overemphasized. This is so because black women's struggle should not be narrowly understood as only a component part of a global system. To say I am the proper African woman is to go beyond what feminism can conceptualize. It is to draw from roots that empower women that speak about what they accomplish and that accords them the autonomy they have. Not that they deserve what they have. African women's stories in most of this literature, in most of the, of the literature that we read, it's as if they began to exist at the encounter with the abductors during the so-called uh, transatlantic slave trade, or perhaps the invaders during colonialism. I would like to say, um, practically, I believe that we should not only focus on, on the girl child. We should also rigorously look at the boy child. Welcome to the fourth African International Project, which today is going to focus on principles of leadership in higher education. African International Project is a flagship of our university. Through this program, we are afforded an opportunity as a university community to reflect on some pertinent questions that are facing the higher education sector, but also that are facing our society in general. The new education must prepare our students in a world of floods to be ready no matter what comes next. It must empower them to be leaders of innovation and to be able not only to adapt to the changing world but also to change the world. We are dealing with a lot of young people from a lot of broken homes. The family system is in crisis. When people come to the university, they must be wanting to come and make a difference, be creative, innovative. How can I come up with something that, you know, innovate, something new that nobody has ever done before? Far from the contemporary prophets, intellectuals are those amongst us who are institutionally educated and have the mandate to contribute in different ways to the production and development of cultural Good. Ladies and gentlemen, it is once again a great pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you uh, to this installment of the African Intellectuals Project. Now, as far as we all know, the project has supported us to learn from some of the great minds in our country, from the continent and indeed across the African diaspora. One of the things we wanted to define, which still eludes South Africa, was who are we? What is our identity? As you know, when Tao made the statement, I think in 1996 or maybe in May, front of the parliament, and said he was an African, it created a storm. Now, there are not many countries like in the UK when you can say I'm British and people start crying. We do not seek an African personality that would lead to Edward Blyden's purity and simplicity of black people. In Africa, leaders without ideas have a state power. <laughs> and then those with ideas don't stay low. What makes a person who visits New York for a week and when they return, they actually are American. The problem you have is that you've been speaking about Africanization. It's 
instead of speaking about re Africanization, because in our mind we think that we are going to turn what is European into what is African. In introducing today's topic, I just want to trace the lack of peace that we are experiencing uh, on our continent, but obviously understand it within the context of colonialism. This I do deliberately on a rather dangerous assumption that uh, our advocate will focus primarily on contemporary debates around peace building and for our continent. I intend to address the assignment that I've been given in three parts. The first part, which has three segments, is an examination of the nature and causes of conflicts that involve African states and countries outside of Africa. Second segment is interstate conflicts, and the third segment is intra-state conflicts. It is this state of neocolonialism, or what we now call coloniality, combined with a stubborn ethnic tribal mentality that was left by colonialism that contributes to the many conflicts that we see on our continent. Just from a simple point of view, I don't want my text to be given to a body that's not going to benefit it. Because the, the African Union gets funded by our taxes. Uh, in a situation where we have got a 50% youth unemployment restless. The Chinese master strategist, Sun Tzu, advises that, one, to know your enemy, you must become your enemy. I see Advocate Boone's lecture, you know, as, as reflective of the quest to go to the root cause of, um, you know, causes of the African um, conflict um, in, in, in the sense of it being an, an academic and intellectual inquiry. <coughs> Thank you. I think uh, now we do have a context of what has been happening. And it has actually helped me to understand that uh, the um, African intellectual project is not really a patriarchal project to actually try and portray men as provided greatest ideas. We had a balance uh, thing. And even today, we do have a, we've created that balance in terms of our speakers. And uh, it gives me ple great pleasure, it's a privilege to introduce our key note speakers for the day. Professor Pumla Dineo Prola is the Dean of Research at the University of Forte. She was previously a professor in the School of Literature, Languages and Media at the University of Witwatersrand and a senior lecturer in the English Department at the University of Free State and the Chief Research Specialist in the Research Program, Societies, Culture, and Identity at the Human Science Research Council. Our um, speaker is a renowned author of four books. The pioneering study was What is Slavery to Me? Post-Colonial Slave Mem Memory in a Post-Apartheid South Africa published by Best Press in 2010. She has also written on issues around, uh, the next book is around rape, a South African nightmare, and awarded the Sunday Times Allen Patin Award for non-fiction in 2016. She's also written a book, A Renegade, called Simpiwe, uh, published in 2013, and most recently, she has a book, A Reflecting Rogue Inside the Mind of a Feminist, which was published in 2017. She has been the inaugural chair of judges for the Literature Prize, Eti Salat, for the first Pan-African Literature Prize and the NIHSS Fiction Panel, as well as a 
serving on several other international literature panels, including the Common Wealth Prize. He holds a master's degree from University of Cape Town and Warwick, and the D. Phil Magnam Cum Laude from University of Munich. She sits on the editorial boards of various prestigious journals, including Women's Studies International Forum, Feminist Africa, Africa Identities, and Journal of African Cultural Studies, and is a member of the Minister of Higher Education Ministerial Task Team on Gender-Based Violence in Universities. And um, I guess I should um, invite her to come and give us a <coughs> lecture, and then thereafter I will introduce our next guest. Thank you, Professor Alenda. Good morning. It's still morning, isn't it? Yes. Good morning, everybody, and thank you to each one of you for coming. I'm sure you all had many things you could have chosen to do instead. So I genuinely appreciate that this is what you chose, especially on a Friday morning in the essays and exam end of the academic year. And at UNISA, where you have an even larger load of essay marking than, 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 than the rest of us in the academy. Professor Makanya, VC of UNISA, thank you for honoring me with this opportunity. UNISA Vice Principals, Professor Sotrikwa Meiwa Ndlovu, Dr. Mukhobu, Professor Simpiwe Sesant for inviting me and for your patience, which I tested considerably. Mm -hmm. Professor Lindiwe Zungu, Executive Dean of Graduate Studies for your extreme generosity and grace. Deans and Directors at UNISA and UNISA Leadership, academics, students, colleagues, and Director Professor, um, Director of, of, of um, Quality Assurance in the VC's office, Professor Lalendle, um, who I will slightly embarrass by pointing out is not only my homeboy, but we were both very little in primary school together for a long time. And that's all I will disclose about what exactly. <laughs> it's very good to see you. Professor Mgomezulu, I'm really looking forward to your lecture. <laughs> Let me get to it. Scholarly traditions, across the disciplines and thematic traditions have illuminated how fear is both a complex emotion and a social political tool of regulation. So I'll be speaking um, a bit about fear today. Much scholarship marries the control of public spaces and collective cultures of fear. To those of us who study colonialism and slavery, this is a recurring thread, the use of fear. Fear here is enacted through the spectacular enactment of violence, through the wounding of the body, the caning of the body, rape, lynching, public execution, and other ways of communicating to the spectator, often unwilling spectator, the force of violence as language. In other words, when slaves witness brutality enacted on others over and over and over again, they begin to understand a certain order of logics. Such understanding travels through fear. First, the spectacular performance of violence communicates legitimate versus delegitimized power. So it is not simply an enactment of power for its own sake. 
communicates legitimate versus delegitimate, delegitimized power. Inscribing in the spectator, the viewer, the, the viewer's mind's eye also who is valuable rather than safe to violate. This language of the spectacle works to foreground what is seen versus what is thought, as Njabula Ndebele has also eloquently and repeatedly taught us. This language of spectacle works to foreground what is seen versus what is thought or felt or understood, imagined, felt, it celebrates normalizes and naturalizes the performance of violence and invites shame and self-censor. Second, it institu institutionalizes ownership of and fear as public collective experience. So when I speak about fear then, I'm speaking about fear in the sense, in the social, political, historic sense, and not so much as of, 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 of the, of the, of the perhaps perfectly normal individual um, emotional experience of fear. The late great Zimbabwean novelist and academic Yvonne Vera writes both hauntingly and beautifully of how bodies are trained over generations to enact patterns of fear and ownership. In her novel, Butterfly Burning, she does so in many places, but for today's purposes, I will only mention two because these two illustrate different aspects of the relationships, of the relations of fear and public space that I want to um, explore with you today. In one scene, Vera refers to the scene, in one, in one site in the novel, sorry, she refers to the scene of, collective, of the collective lynching of several men hung by their necks from trees in Rhodesia. Here, these bodies left for days in plain view are an assault in many ways to the humans thus treated, but also to the casual passerby, the worker en route to work, the schoolgirl on her way to school, the neighbor who may recognize a certain curve of the shoulder in the, in the, in the bodies hanging from the trees. The immediacy, in other words, the fear is in the details. To those who recognize one of the hanging men's bodies as a beloved, the immediacy of the threat is communicated in the swift swiftness of the blink. To the passerby who may not have known any of them alive, the knowledge of her own unsafety is introduced effectively. And so she begins to think, pointlessly, as we know. She begins to think about how she might avoid being what Billie Holiday calls somewhere else, strange fruit. Because this language of fear, of race, of brutality as spectacle, is also well known in Holiday's part of the world. Fear communicates very clearly, the spectacle communicates very clearly, you are not safe. It could be you. Lesson learned. Vera's second example is in how she describes not just the rural or natural landscape, but how she writes of black bodies moving in Zimbabwean, in, in Zimbabwean cities. So not in Rhodesia now, but in Zimbabwe, early Zimbabwean cities. Long after laws prohibiting natives from walking on the pavement, many of her characters in the same novel move in very specific ways. Many of her characters move defiant, lively, stylish, loudly through the city, but defiant, lively, stylish, loudly through the city as they are, to a man or woman, the body, retains an intergenerational memory. Crowds manage this choreographed avoidance of the pavement. Long after legal prohibition has lapsed. Crowds manage this choreographed avoidance of the pavement. 
and other similar spaces retained from a time, for some before they were born, passed on unwillingly and unwittingly to them. And I remember the last time I taught this novel to my students um, at a at Vets, and I was living in Gauteng. And I remember the way, I mean, I'd read this novel as a, as a professor of literature and I'd taught it several times before, but I remember the last time I taught it living in Johannesburg, it, there, there, was, there was an additional lesson for me because, of course, as being a, 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 an academic who drove through Gauteng um, constantly, one of the, perhaps I should be embarrassed to say, but I'll declare it anyway, and you can judge me, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> One of the things that, it irritated, that, that, that continued to be a particular irritation in the area that I lived was how even when there were huge pavements, pedestrians would often walk in the road so that I would have to swerve. And I remember reading, and as I was talking about, about, about as I was teaching Vera's text, this particular lesson jumped off the page. This notion of how Suddenly, as I drove home that afternoon or evening, my irritation, which I had trained well, paused somewhat. And I think this is important for a variety of reasons, but I won't be preachy as a professor of literature. Um, so often when we talk about how, how literature theorizes, how it instructs, how it does more than just tell stories, how the lessons and the theorization in creative texts um, function, we often are speaking of this kind of jarring and pause, an invitation to pause. Thus, Vera teaches us that fear is not just present when we recognize it as such, it is also sometimes in present in cultures that resist the sources of the same fear. Now, I'm not saying that the reason people walk in the middle of the road in Southern Africa is only because of the intergenerational memory of a time when we had laws across Southern African cities that prohibited natives walking on pavements. I'm saying that is part of that memory. There's of course also a memory and an insistence and an agency that is about claiming space and choosing differently. And that hooks into other um, traditions of being in space. Speaking to a South African audience 25 years after our own flag independence, perhaps I need not point to the ways in which apartheid geography perfected the use of fear, whether it be through the colonial wars of conquest, the Land Act, forced removals, caspers in townships, or state of emergencies. And so I was somewhat disturbed by how many of us called for state of emergencies recently as a solution to something. As a black South African who lived under several states of emergencies and certainly would not like to see the return. States of emergencies, past control, influx control, past control, influx control. We understand something about the full force of the law in enshrining fear and thus desperately trying to keep the undesirable in place. We have an archive, and one that continues to grow necessarily so, of analyses on the links between public articulation and inarticulation on the one hand and regulation. Fear works similarly in the interest of neocolonial and or, or dictatorial rules as one of my later examples will show, or some of my later examples will show. In my own work, I have come to understand that there are intimate connections between fear and rape culture, or sexual violence as a whole, because racial oppression, because white supremacy is also, I'm gonna say this part slowly because there's significant resistance to this, because racial oppression, i.e. white supremacy, is also made through sexual violence. It is not difficult to see that what we see in fear and sexual violence applies to how race, negrophobia, xenophobia, and other forms of violence work. In my third book, Rape is South African Nightmare, I battle with this notion 
of how to understand how exactly it is that fear works um, to maintain rape culture. I speak of what I call in that text the manufacture of female fear and sometimes the female fear factory. And the female fear factory works as a factory to produce certain things. And so I call it the manufacture of female fear because it is not an incidence, it is a very deliberate process, process, process processual. <laughs> it is a factory. And in this factory, rape functions as both a language, not a moment, as a language, and the threatened outcome. Deviance, of course, is also punished so that one script, so that they, so that, so that, if, to the enshrinement of a script about how to behave appropriately in public. But what does this language communicate? This language is partly about keeping women in place. If you do not do X, you will be asking for it. If you do not dress appropriately, you will be asking for it. If you do not stay controlled, you will be asking for it. Fear is also an apt communication of contempt for women's bodies, freedoms, and very humanity. And so the female fear factory is partly a weapon of feminine control, but it, because it is patriarchal communication, rape is a weapon and the female fear factory functions in the interest of patriarchal control and therefore not just against women. Because no patriarchal tools function exclusively against women. When I started in my much earlier um, academic career, the literature of the black consciousness movement um, published in the literary journal Stuff Rider, I was struck by how present the trope of rape was in many of the short stories between 1978 and 1988, the first 10 years of Staff Rider. And I was struck by Staff Rider um, specifically because it was, um, and still is, was the biggest literary um, factory in the South African context, right? It was the biggest, it was the most successful literature uh, journal, but it also produced two significant bodies of, 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 of South African writers generations of South African writers. I was struck in this body of literature by how many times rape occurred and how rape occurred each time as an authorizing trope, as a trope of punishment. And so, perhaps 40% of the stories published over 10 years, it became possible to see who, which kinds of characters, would be written as rapes. And to a woman, all the rape characters were black women who acted out of turn. So if they drank, if you were introduced to a character that drank alcohol and stuff rider, at some point in that short story, she would get raped. If she loved inappropriately, she loved someone she wasn't supposed to love, at some point in that story, she would get raped. If she did not listen to her husband and went to work in um, a white household, because of how much time was spent in chastising her for not listening to her husband before leaving home, that would be the day where her white master would rape her. And it goes on like this over and over and over and over again. This notion of rape as punishment for deviant, for inappropriate black women's behavior. Now this is striking particularly in Staff Rider because Staff Rider literature celebrates deviance. A Staff Rider, not just as you will know, some of you will know, the Gautengas will know, a Staff Rider is, is staff riders are those, those young men who ride on the side of the, of the trains outside, outside the carriage. Um, and so it was named after um, an aspect of black experience that was defiant, right? So defiance, black defiance is at the very heart of the Staff Rider project. 
and all of the heroic celebrated characters are characters who act completely outside of the script given by, 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 by capitalist, white supremacist, patriarchy. But only if they are male characters. So while all of the characters, male and women, defy heroic, Staff rider celebrated, heroism for the celebration of black deviance is only accorded to defiant black men characters. Now, of course, it's fiction, but you have to ask yourself what this is really about. Because those writers did not sit in one room and say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to produce this body of work. These were writers drawn across, from across South Africa, from different, from different contexts. But it also means something, which I'm not going to answer. I'm just going to lay it for all of us to reflect on, and then I'm going to move on. It also says something instructive about what it means to be the subject, to be the reader, to be the audience of Staff Rider, then. This is a magazine that affirms black transgression. This is a magazine that is revolutionary, that is about changing the world. And it explicitly claims to be invested in the project of creating and circulating positive black images. So what does it mean then to be a black, young black man reader of this magazine that celebrates black male transgression as heroic, but that to a woman character penalizes black woman transgression of any kind as the precursor to rape? What does it mean to be a young black woman, or a black woman of any, or to be a woman reading this text and coming to a sense of what it means to be, to inhabit blackness with a capital T, right? So not, not non-whiteness, not all of these other things that BC teaches us away from. The Female Fear Factory is about keeping women in place, and, in place, and this is why rape is such an important part of how the Female Fear Factory works, the manufacture of female fear. It's about ensuring we can continue to stay in place because we are always under surveillance. And of course, in that book and elsewhere in my work and in this class, I mean, in this, in this lecture, I will argue for its constant unapologetic disruption. The disruption of the process of manufacturing female fear factory. And I'll tell very quickly, because some of you have read that book, are probably sick of hearing me tell this story, but it's one of my favorite stories, so I indulge me. I'll tell it quickly. So I tell a story about Lebu Pule, who is in a shop, who's a, 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 a writer and, and um, storyteller uh, from, 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 from Alex, who grew up in Alex, continues, who lives in, okay, it doesn't matter. She still lived in Johannesburg at the time. She walks, into a, she walks into a shop in, in, in the inner city in Johannesburg, and she experiences the scene, and this is the scene. She walks in, and there's a young woman who, there's several people in the shop. It's not a big shop. There's several people in the shop, and there's a young woman um, who catches her attention immediately. And, and, and she does so because she is performing a dance that many young women are trained and socialized into. She has, there's a young man who's trying to get her attention. She doesn't want his attention. And so she does what women, girls are groomed to do. She ignores him. She turns her body away. She moves away. He continues to follow and try to get her attention. She does not speak to him. And she moves through the shop trying to get away from him, using her body to create distance between herself and him. And she does this for about 10 minutes. Nobody else in the shop says anything. Eventually, she snaps and she says, leave me alone. His response is, you see, this is why we rape you. Pula's response, everybody in the shop gasps. Pule decides, Lebu Pule decides, 
Gasping is insufficient. She is infused with rage. She screams back at him. Why is this? Why you rape them, us? How many women have you raped? Right? So she challenges him and she flies in this, to this kind of fit of fury. And what is interesting is also what everybody else in the shop does. Right? So they all look at her. Oh my goodness, we've got a crazy white right? We've got a crazy feminist woman in the in the in the in the, in the shop. The woman herself, the young woman, turns to her and starts to console Bule. And this too is instructive. She says, don't worry, Sisi. He's rubbish. They're rubbish. Don't ignore it. It happens all the time. Don't get yourself so worked up. Thank you. But there's a type of person who does this all the time. He's rubbish. Do not worry yourself. Now, of course, what is interesting there is that what Bule does is disrupt female fear, the construction, the manufacture of female fear, because everybody in that shop recognizes the situation. And the man who follows and ultimately threatens this woman knows that everybody in the shop recognizes this situation and will look away. And they will go home to talk about how it happened or not. Because in many ways it is so unspectacular, so normal. This harassment in public of women, this entitlement, this, this unabashed, forced claim of women's bodies by men they do not know. And sometimes no, but even by strange men. And so he knows that nobody will say a thing. The woman know, the young woman knows this too. But to know it does not mean she cannot appreciate the gesture that Bulle extends to her. Okay, so I'm gonna stop with that story. I have another story, and then I'm gonna stop with the stories and go back to. <laughs> or maybe I won't. We'll see how badly behaved I can be and still stick to my time. I have another story, and this one is a recent, is a new favorite from the Egyptian American feminist journalist and essayist Mona El Tahawi's latest book, Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls, which is a most <laughs> delightful, <laughs> troublemaking read. In that book, she tells of a story of how she is so enraged after having gone through a very hard time personally, um, she decides to go to, she goes, she decides to go da dancing with her partner and she's groped in a club as she dances on the dance, dance floor, as, as she's on the dance floor. She turns around and starts and chases her assailant, pushes him and starts hitting him. And again, everybody in the club thinks, another crazy woman. This is illogical, another historical, crazy, badly behaved woman. Until someone points out that actually he assaulted her. She then goes on to Twitter later on and she tells a story and she's surprised by how many women from different parts of the African and other world, women from Asia who say, I also beat my assailant. I notice your response is significantly different than the response to Pule's disruption. El Tahawi beat a man who assaulted her in a club, and this is counterintuitive, just like Pule's response. Both responses are counterintuitive to patriarchy because women are safe to violate. Because the guarantee of safety provided by a lifetime of production into the female, fe fe female fear factory and location in the female fear factory is that women will not respond. Right? So 
we know that women are safe to violate because women will use their body to get away from. They will walk away, they will do anything but retaliate. El Tahawi had been beaten, had her arms broken and sexually assaulted when she joined many in the Egyptian revolution. Her military assaulters told her that they knew who she was. The point in telling her this as they arrested and tortured her was to make sure she knew it was a response to her feminist activism, her intellectual work, her inappropriate Egyptian Muslim woman-ness, and as correction for her stepping out, out, of, out of line. Except this is not entirely accurate. This is partly why she was beaten and sexually assaulted and arrested, but this is not the full picture. Because many unfamous women were beaten, broken, sexually assaulted in that movement by soldiers and police officers, as well as by men who were supposed to be their comrades. El Tahawi underscores that it is because she is known and visible, however, that she was freed alive from detention. She had been able to borrow someone's phone and tweet to her thousands of followers that she'd been arrested and was being detained by Egyptian police and soldiers and identify the location. Al-Tahawi, at a different time, was arrested in the US for spray painting and defacing a subway poster in New York that was both racist and Islamophobic. Two events of institutionalized violence. They are not moments, but like wrong-facing studs on a chokehold. She was not supposed to respond to any of these provocations. She was supposed to be the broken, corrected, altered, receiving body. Fear and violence are necessary for control. Nobody is supposed to beat their assaulter especially when the body being assaulted belongs to a woman, a queer man, a gender fluid or non-conforming person, a person living with a disability, a trans person, an African in a white supremacist context, or any number of disposable others. Fear and violence are necessary for control. They inscribe what is possible and what is impossible. Zimbabwean feminist Isabella Matambanazo reminds us that autocratic states are also terrified by the violence of the people. This, Matamba Nazo shows us, is key to understanding the complicated system of inversion at the heart of patriarchal and indeed white supremacist logic. But I'd like to move to a different part of the continent, to a case that is probably familiar to many of you. Dr. Stella Nyanzi in Uganda has been criminalized for the kind of critical faculties we insist we want to see more of in the academy. The critical faculties that Professor Makanya was talking about as celebrated by Said, by Chomsky, by all manner of intellectual traditions. The critical capacity, this intellectual capacity to disrupt and to speak. But she has been criminalized for precisely this kind, the kind of critical faculty we, kind of faculties we insist we want to see more of in the academy, all academies, and especially those of us located in the humanities and social sciences. We insist often that we are interested in producing not bodies for the market, but critical thinkers who are able to come up with much needed new ways of approaching the messy business of being human at this time on this planet. Yet Nyanzi's criticism of a country's head of state and her decision to take poetic license by wishing that he had never been born. Specifically wishing his mother had never pushed him out of her birth canal and vagina. Yes, I just said vagina in the Senate hall. <laughs> that she had instead poisoned him through her body, suffocated him, led to her persecution and imprisonment. The contestation here is clear. The offense is not just wishing that Ugandans did not have to live through Museveni's rule. It is not just an unjust trial. 
an assault against creative use of language, freedom of speech, and academic freedom. Although it is also these, the response to Nyanzi is also about her specific use of language, of the language of women's body parts that is considered profane in patriarchal societies across the world. Because ownership of women's body parts has to be patriarchally sanctioned. To speak of the president's mother's vagina and birth canal is to insult the president. Because women's bodies are insults. They remarked upon irony in much of the commentary on, on, on Nyanzi's trial, which is actually not an irony at all, is that Dr. Nyanzi's scholarship is on sexual and bodily autonomy across sexual orientations, bodily expression, and as an African feminist scholar in a long line of African feminist creative writers and academics, the invitation to widen the prescription and confining meanings ascribed to mothering. What happens? If we counterintuitively assume that the fact of Nyanzi's scholarship and queer activism's focus is not accidental to where she finds herself today. What happens if, despite the calls to see Nyanzi as strange, a badly behaved African woman, we recall and make a connection to the public and institutionalized responses to Sylvia Damale in the same country in 2003. What patterns begin to emerge then? Professor Sylvia Damale, professor, sociologist, lawyer, and dean of law, was dubbed the 2003 worst woman of the year in Uganda. She was mocked, chastised, and vilified in Kampala dailies, a new vision poll, a new vision poll at the end of the year garnered enough votes for her to be, uh, to, be, to be accorded this title because of her unwavering support for sexual rights, bodily autonomy, sexual freedoms for several weeks of that year. Subsequent to this, and I won't spend much time on this one, um, we've also seen the jailing of Swongi Lendashe and 12 of her colleagues in a different context in October 2017 by Tanzanian authorities who charged them with promoting homosexuality. And of course, all of these attempts to name, to spectac spectacularize, to mark as different, as alone, to isolate, to mark as strange, homeless, our attempts to terrorize, to instill fear, were in a way where there isn't evidence of appropriate fear. Damale responds to being accorded New Vision's 2003 Woman of the Year title by printing a badge and wearing it, making herself a Worst Woman of the Year badge of honor that she speaks of wearing with pride and dignity. Against all this backdrop, I have in mind Jessica Horn's insistence that we ask ourselves what sexual rights mean in contexts of state and otherwise sponsored and publicly supported homophobia and misogyny across the continent. Horn is clear about the need to think about our own locations. And often we think about and we talk as though the academy is a place that, excuse me, that provides safety when we do as Chomsky, as Said, as our own desires inspire. But what is our responsibility? What is our thinking? When sites in the academy, in fact, do not provide such protection. What is the place of a word much beloved of activists, but somewhat uneasy for those of us located in the academy? What is the place of solidarity to intellectual work? Do we have a responsibility as academics if we believe in academic freedom, if we believe in critical vocabulary, if we believe in what we say the university is for, if we believe 
in the location of intellectual work on the African continent to a transformative, not just transformative, not just decolonial, but ultimately freedom project. What then is our responsibility to the jailing and criminalization of dissent? And is there a specific responsibility when such criminalization of dissent is against academics elsewhere located. I could also tell the story of Shalja Patel, but I suspect that too is quite familiar, and Professor um, Wambui Mwangi um, in Kenya, who's been successfully sued, both of whom have been successfully sued, for an amount for 900 Kenyan shillings, which at the time, on the date of the judgment, was equivalent to roughly 1.3 million rands for daring to speak, for daring to say, I believe Shalja, when she said this particular writer, Tony Muchama, assault, sexually assaulted her. So Tony Muchama then successfully sues Patel and Wangi and for a variety of things, an apology, um, and, and, and so on. And again here, yeah, we can talk about exiling, we can talk about suing, we can talk about irony, we can focus on the details. We can talk about the irony that both Patel and Mwangi's work is about undoing shame. That Patel's work specifically is about visibility and crafting new language to talk about African freedoms. In Patel's Migratude, her best known book, Patel prompts us to reflect on ways of inhabiting African contemporaneities and indeed our own skins standing at the meeting point of multiple inheritances of travel, displacement, hybridization, and discovery in context of oppression, creativity, and resistance. Professor Mwangi's own work is on how to think about economies of freedom and oppression. And of course, the ways in which silence is a woman in the making and unmaking of African independence, as the title of one of her essays asserts. What is our response collectively? What is the intellectual response to the criminalization of dissent? What is the intellectual response as African intellectuals, as people located in the academy who enjoy and defend and claim to instill these values in our students, in ourselves, to the criminalization of critical consciousness, to intellectual work, to the isolation and the spectacularization that we see, but also to the larger criminalization of dissent or leftist traditions of resistance that we also hold dear as African academics, as African intellectuals, because we continue, successive generations make the connection between freedom, between decoloniality, between anti-coloniality, between Pan-Africanism, between black consciousness, so between radical tradition, between feminism, between radical traditions and intellectual work. And if indeed this connection that we return to again and again and again is more than mere performance in the older sense, not in the post-structural sense of performance, in the older sense, if it's more than mere performance, what then is the responsibility to the criminalization of leftist traditions of resistance. Each of the moments I have alluded to and spoken through today is illustrative of emergent nexi of power and violence. In old and new ways, fluent in establishing regimes while inaugurating new mutations whose traces are evident in the locations beyond the studied examples. What does it mean to take up the invitation that Desiree Lewis, South African feminist, located at Professor um, Gomez Zulu's um, institution, invitation that we meet such criminalization with serious engagement with difference, not an aversion to difference. And how she also teaches us in her work 
But hypervisibilization, this marking as exceptional and hypervisible, is also always there when we see cases of erasure and myth-making. What to make then of this, of, this, of this invitation in this context, in a context outlined by several examples that I've used as shorthand to speak about um, these emergent trends. How then in this context, as Professor Makanya invites us to do, do we expose the truth as intellectuals? And of course, the invitation in Chomsky's larger body of work is also to an ethical engagement with traditions of dissent. Even if he often assumes protections provided by academic locations that we can't. Perhaps I'll just end rather abruptly then by pointing to two things. In one of the clips, well, in the beautiful clip prepared for us by the College of Graduate Studies, um, Professor Zungu's people, um, <laughs> Professor Sesanti speaks about the importance of not turning what is European into what is African. And imagine that this is a creative, progressive, even radical, world-changing response. That comment rang particularly true also in a context where recently we would all have experienced the many, many angered responses to the recent judgment against caning, beating children, and how many people insisted that this is, an, this is a disruption, this is going too far, this is an incursion against African cultures, which is fascinating and troubling to me as a scholar of coloniality of slavery, given the fact that we know that caning, the disciplining of the body is a very important part of introducing colonial control. What does it mean then when we're defending an archetypally colonial form of instilling fear, of communicating fear, and of controlling African bodies as an African practice that we insist on using against our children? What does it mean also given the archive of colonial administrative journals who have anxieties about how this disciplining regime is often absent from the improperly masculine African men and African societies. Many ironies to grapple with as we think about a project, an intellectual project, an African intellectual project that holds on, that retains its connection to freeing and transformative and world-changing and decolonial and anti-colonial and, and so on, um, radical thought and action, and is always weary of turning what is European into what is African as a lazy exercise. Damala reminds us that feminists in Africa today and others have to contend with a resurgence of cultural, economic, and religious fundamentalisms, which represent patriarchal and capitalist extremism. These are protected by repressive um, patriarchal institutions that will stop at nothing to protect power and privilege. And this is particularly important for those of us who teach in the academy who like to think of the work that we do as part of how we transform, part of how we do what bell hooks, an intellectual from a different part of the African world, the African-American feminist bell hooks, calls teaching to transgress, or a radical from the South Asian world, um, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, has talked about as the importance of, lefty, of leftist academics to insist on 
being located both inside and outside of the teaching machine. Thank you, Professor Kola, for an intriguing lecture, and I request um, members um, in, the, <coughs> in, in the Senate hall to jot down their questions and issues because we'll have a question and answer after Professor Gomez will have spoken. Give me the opportunity then to introduce uh, Professor Becky R. Mgomezulu who is a full professor of political science and a deputy dean of research at the University of the Western Cape, South Africa. He holds seven degrees in history, political science, and education, in addition to a SSTD, which is a senior secondary teacher's diploma. Therefore, he is a teacher by profession. Um, he has published five books including The Presidents for Life, Pandemic in Africa, 10 book chapters, and several journal articles. In his sixth book on post-apartheid South Africa foreign policy is currently in press, and he has formerly served as CEO of um, Zala Malo Center, and also the senior lecturer and the academic leader of international and public affairs cluster at the University of KwaZulu Natal. He is also a political analyst for various TV and radio stations you might have seen there in newspapers. Professor Mgomezulu has visited a number of countries in which um, he has been a visiting professor at the University in Sweden and also in Romania. His research interests include international relations and comparative African politics higher education and traditional leadership, among others. Professor Mugumuzumu, the podium is yours, sir. Thank you. time is it now? Is it good day? Okay, good day ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me, let me uh, assure your colleagues that I'm not going to offend the politicians today. I'm notorious for doing that. And uh, normally whenever there is something happening in the country, that's why all my phones are off as for strategic reasons, because if something happens even at 12 midnight, for some reason the media thinks that I have answers to that, even if I had nothing to do with it. When Mashaba resigns, I have to explain. When Musma Emani resigns, I have to explain. When we can't tell who is the leader of the PAC, I have to explain. I don't know how they got it right or got it wrong. Uh, uh, Professor Makanya, normally in, in Guazulu Natal, we just say to save time, I would just say, Professor Makanya Nebanja. <laughs> so, in that sense, we don't have to greet anyone individually. But there is one thing I need to say. Uh, last year, there was an issue with Patricia Delil, and my advice was that Patricia Delil must just uh, put the record straight and exit the stage. Because at the time, I said uh, she had become dispensable. Uh, the DA in the Western Cape elected Bongos Matigizela, who is a black guy, so they were assured of black voters, so they thought. And then they strategically elected uh, uh, Albert Fritz, uh, who is a colored guy. They thought they are assured of the colored vote, not realizing that Albert Fritz does not enjoy the, the same support that Patricia Tirel had. And then after the Patricia Tirel issue, uh, I received five anonymous letters. The first one said one of eight. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you why I'm saying this. And then the first one, in fact, used any word you can think of about black people, using even the K word, saying that 85% of people of black people should be killed and all stuff like that. But because I knew what I was doing and I knew why I was doing it, 
I stood my ground. So these anonymous, uh, uh, these anonymous letters came the first, second, fourth, fifth. I think when we reached five, the author realized that uh, I'm dealing with someone who is not smart. Uh, because the more the letters came, the more vocal I was. I stood my ground. And then, of course, they've stopped there. I hope they're still pending the other three. So I'm waiting for them, and then I'll still continue. The reason why I'm saying this is because uh, we have a problem with our intellectuals. They are easily intimidated. Whenever you want to say something right, and then somebody else challenges you, and then you retreat, that's a sign of cowardice. So it's in that spirit then that uh, when I got an invitation from this institution, I crafted my talk, Impediments to an Active African Intelligentsia in Championing the Africanization Agenda. So I'm basically moving from the assumption that uh, we do have an intelligentsia, but that intelligentsia is not active and is not visible. And the question is why? So those are the questions I'll try to address. Uh, I'm not going to bore you about this outline because of time. I'll just uh, cut to the chase. Uh, first of all, I start off by saying that uh, the title itself is already presumptuous. It assumes two things. One, that we have a black intelligentsia, and two, that uh, that black intelligentsia is less active. So that's, that's the assumption from which I'm moving. And then, uh, talking about intelligentsia, we know for a fact, that is from a general perspective, it's an issue that has been going on for quite a long time. So when we talk about black intelligentsia, we are not being uh, innovative. We are just contributing to the debate. And to this day, the discussion uh, still continues, but unfortunately, there are very few people who participate in it. Uh, you'll agree with me that uh, there are many things that are going wrong, and our intelligentsia has become invisible, and very few people are asking the question, where is our intelligentsia? Because we have made peace with the fact that we have an inactive intelligentsia. Uh, part of the reason, of course, is that uh, the caliber of the intelligence that we have today has been changing over time. And as the time changes, as the context changes, the caliber of the intelligence also changes. Uh, but also, uh, the responsibility of the intelligence is never static. When we have an issue today, we will not have the same issue tomorrow, but the intelligence has to be always visible. Any change in the nature, uh, of society affects a uh, uh, social community and the intelligence in terms of uh, structural and functional features. So the point here is that uh, whenever there is a change uh, that happens in society, of course, uh, we'll expect the intelligence to re-strategize. We don't want an intelligence that is redundant, uh, that uh, just takes to the, uh, sticks to the rules that are no longer applicable, that no longer uh, relate to the current context. So we want an intelligentsia that will always evolve over time. And the African in intelligentsia, of course, should not be seen as an inco incongruity. In other words, when we talk about the black intelligentsia, we are not talking about an anom anomaly or an anomalous situation. Globally, uh, there are people who are talking about the same topic, but of course in different contexts. Uh, Edwards made the following statements. Internationally, the study that I quote, internationally, the status of intellectuals uh, is a long-standing theme in academic, political, and public policy discussions and writing. So that then affirms the point I'm making that uh, the issue of intelligentsia is a global issue, and when we talk about it here in Africa, we are just contributing to the debate. As leaders in society, uh, the intelligentsia, of course, uh, cannot afford to fold its arms and watch from a distance while the African continent uh, is going astray and when it's collapsing. And the intelligentsia cannot wait while we have, there is a term we use in political science, lutocracy, when our politicians literally loot the state and the intelligentsia is silent, meaning that uh, we are part of the system. So we cannot wait when those things are happening. Uh, I made a point uh, one time that uh, uh, the book that uh, was read by uh, Professor uh, 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 Lamile here, saying that uh, the title of the book was uh, The President for Life Pandemic in Africa. And that book uh, became controversial. In fact, people started getting interest in it in the Netherlands because it was published in the UK even before it came out, when they were seeing previews. They were saying very few people are prepared to challenge African leaders. I said, no, for me, 
Uh, if you threaten me that you are going to be my enemy, I just laugh at you. I say, I already have enough enemies. And then you say, no, but I want to be your friend. I said, no, I can't buy your friendship. I already have enough friends. So whether I want to be my friend or my enemy just doesn't matter. I have enough of each. So I wrote this book and some leaders were not happy. And then when they, the few who confronted me, I explained to them and they understood the context from which I was operating. Uh, there is a German uh, physicist and theoretician called Albert Einstein. He has said a number of things, some of which my colleagues here might have quoted at some point. But then the one that I like the most is the following. I quote, the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. There's a problem. So if the political leadership uh, is wrong by taking the country to a different road, of course it's a problem. But the, the most important problem is when the intelligence remains silent when those things are happening. So Einstein then was warning us that uh, we cannot as an intelligence keep quiet when things are going wrong. If the intelligence uh, sits and, uh, and watches on with claimed objectivity while things uh, go wrong in society, of course that amounts to the reliction of duty. In other words, we've ceased to do what we are supposed to do as intelligence. Against this backdrop, therefore, I discuss the challenges faced by the African intelligence uh, regarding the implementation uh, of the Africanization project. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I would want to just quickly go through these uh, concepts. We, we already know them, but I'll explain them for a reason, because normally we assume that concepts are known and the explanation is self-explanatory, whatever else we can think of. But here I'll just go through a few. Starting with intelligence, uh, it will be uh, er erroneous uh, for us to assume that uh, all educated people con uh, co uh, contribute uh, to the intelligence uh, category or, or belong to the intelligence category. There are many people who are educated, but very few of them are part of the intelligence. Uh, that, that is a fact. People can hate me for that, but that is a fact. So the fact that you have a degree is not enough. The question is, what are you doing with your degree? I was telling uh, some people who are, I was invited to give a talk, and uh, my, my, my talk there was premised on the understanding that uh, don't let your past determine your future. And I used myself as an example. I said I grew up without a father, but that didn't bother me. My mother was a housewife. She never went to school. That didn't bother me. None of my siblings went to school. It didn't bother me. And as a matter of fact, uh, when Prof here said I have uh, seven degrees, people were asking me, I mean, why on earth would you have three masters and then have a PhD in Ohio? I said, no, it's for a reason. I'm in areas. Because my family didn't have any, so I'm making up for my family. So the, the point I'm making here is there are decisions we have to take, and some of those decisions are not comfortable but you have to take them anyway. And that is what an intelligence is to do. If you are an intelligence who wants to make friends, then maybe you are in the wrong profession. You are, we are okay as an educated person, but you cannot be okay as an intelligence because you want to make friends. And people who define intelligence, uh, there are quite a lot. I just used the Merriman Webster dictionary, which says, intelligence refers to intellectuals who form an uh, uh, oh yeah, who form an artistic, a social, or political uh, vanguard uh, or elite. In other words, it's not just all educated people, but it's a special group of the educated people. Uh, and the same point is corroborated by your Cambridge Dictionary and the Collins Dictionary, which uh, says something similar, saying the very educated people in a society, but then it goes on, not just ending by being educated, then you, you must then distinguish yourself what are you doing with your education? And then, of course, under the theme, uh, you have someone called Kramsky. Uh, and then I was happy uh, when Prof. Makanya uh, referred to him because uh, he did my job. I'll just run through this very quickly without any need to explain because he did a fantastic job. So Kramsky then di distinguished between what he called a traditional intellectuals and then, of course, organic intellectuals. I'm not going to explain this because uh, uh, Prof. Makanya I did, a, I did that job for me, but I'm not going to pay him. <laughs> now, when we talk about Africanization, in simple terms, 
uh, it's just giving whatever you do an African flavor without necessarily dismissing knowledge that comes from elsewhere. Like the point that uh, is said is credited to uh, Professor Sisanti is a correct one. The moment you say, let's look at what Europeans have written about us, let's look at, at what Europeans have said about it, about us, and then try to debunk whatever they've put on the table. We're not doing anything. We are basically authenticating what they've said. We must look at issues from an, Af an, an, an African perspective. Whether it's curriculum content, whether it's research methods, anything, we say this is what we're capable of. And we don't have to prove a point, by the way, to the Westerners. We, we don't owe them anything. We just have to do things our own way. Now, the process, uh, the, this basically is the process of giving, uh, of giving something an African outlook. Don't worry about what happens elsewhere, whether it's Chinese, whether it's American, whether it's British, it doesn't really matter. Just give whatever to an African outlook. Uh, it's a situation whereby the African experience does not only constitute uh, the foundation of all forms of knowledge, but is actually uh, the source uh, for the construction of such knowledge. And the Sotra most reminds us. So you, you make sure that uh, whatever you do, you ground it uh, on an African perspective or African worldview. And it refers to that which, uh, uh, quote, puts African uh, produced knowledge first without necessarily dismissing other sources of knowledge. So last year, uh, I published an article in Politico, and some of you might have seen it, uh, where I, uh, I asked the question, what would the Africanization of a political science subject entail? So that's the question I was asking. And then part of uh, uh, trying to deliberate on that issue then was to explain this. And I subsequently received a response. There was a subsequent piece uh, which was published by Roger Southern uh, in the same uh, journal responding to this article. I'm here to respond to him because I've been busy with two manuscripts. Now that they are done, I'll hopefully go back and then respond to him uh, the way I deem it fit. Under Africanization, then, we should go beyond cosmetic. Uh, that's what one of our scholars here, Kacheni Ndovu, reminds us. He says we must go beyond uh, cosmetic changes uh, uh, and then actually form, and I quote, proper anti-systematic uh, movements capable of uh, uh, tackling global colo uh, coloniality uh, on a world scale. So in other words, whenever we talk about Africanization, our focus should not necessarily be Africa per se. We use Africa as a, a starting point, but then we go beyond that. So that we contribute uh, to global knowledge and then not just talk to ourselves. Uh, because if we were to do that, we would have missed the point. Now, the next uh, heading here is understanding black intelligence from a historical perspective. And I'm also happy here because uh, Professor Makanya did my job here. Uh, he, he cited uh, W.P. Du Bois. Uh, there are people who claim that, uh, in fact, he's one of the earliest uh, scholars uh, who uh, marketed intelligentsia and made it out, uh, put it out there and said, this is what uh, someone who, who belongs to the intelligentsia can do. Don't, don't look at what is happening and then shy away from it. Face it head on and then challenge it. If it means that we are killed, so be it. I mean, death is something uh, certain, isn't it? It's just a matter of time. Uh, even if you're a witch doctor, will kill me today, chances are I will die tomorrow. We will die anyway, so what's the point? So to point and said, uh, we cannot as an intelligentsia keep quiet when things are happening. So then he's created then as one of those. And of course, he encouraged fellow African-Americans to construct recent critiques uh, of Southern political economy in America. He said we cannot sit like this when the whites are treating us in this manner uh, in the American South. And then, of course, there are people who said, no, 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 but we can't do this. These people are going to kill us. He said, no, we'll die anyway. Uh, and then we know uh, that uh, some, uh, from uh, what uh, Prof. Gola was saying, uh, the slaves, in fact, they were smart people. Uh, they, and I, in fact, I normally don't use the word slaves. I say enslaved Africans. Uh, whenever these uh, uh, masters were teaching them about religion, they would change it and use it as a weapon. And say, okay, uh, master, you are telling us that uh, God loves all of us, but how come you don't love us? So they're beating them in their own game. A white, a white master that set the rules and then the enslaved Africans were using that as a weapon. So in this case, then two boys then said, we must criticize whatever you see. And then Kilsen then uh, traces uh, intelligentsia and comes up with four stages, which I'll run through very quickly. And then he says, phases. And then he says, in each phase, there were some characteristic features. Phase one, 
uh, it dates it to 1880s to the uh, 1920s, and it calls it the it calls this uh, the formative phase uh, of intelligentsia, which uh, saw the rise of uh, the educated elite. So it says during this time it was still at a formative stage, but you could see that uh, the intelligentsia was coming to the picture. And then, of course, from the 1920s uh, to the 1950s, it was maturing a bit. And it says this phase was characterized by militancy, which was lacking in the first phase because it was still at a formative stage. And there, also there was also movement towards what he calls elite social democratization phase. In other words, the elite were now making their presence felt, and then, of course, they were doing things that were visible in society. And there was also a challenge on white-skinned people, and there was also, uh, the, 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 this also served as the base for the civil rights movement. They said, the fact that you are black and you are treated this way is not right. So therefore, we have to challenge the status quo. And then that was the beginning uh, of serious intelligentsia work. And then the third phase was uh, from the 1960s to the 2000s, where there was changed uh, uh, context. Of course, we know in the African context, in the 1960s and 70s, Africans were free. And then in the, America, in the Americas, uh, then we'll know uh, what kind of history transpired during the time. So, but then this didn't mean that uh, the intelligentsia had to wait uh, for another thing to happen. And in brackets there, I put Mandela's book, Long Walk to Freedom. And the reason is simple. Mandela says, when you climb up a hill and you reach at the rooftop, you reach the summit, you look around, you realize there are still many more. So basically, the fact that uh, you had now the civil rights movement and then blacks were being accommodated and all stuff like that, Africans were getting uh, their political freedom was not enough because there were still more battles uh, to fight. And then the, the, the last phase uh, started then since the 2000s. And in the context of America, uh, this uh, 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 is associated with uh, the rise of uh, Barack Obama uh, to become the first black president in America. So basically uh, giving the impression that uh, Americans have been incorporated into mainstream American politics. But the reality of the matter is that this is not the case. Uh, for the three years I spent in America, I had a taste of this. And I stood my ground. I remember one time, uh, Professor Makanya, challenging uh, university uh, security forces. Because I was coming in, and then on a Saturday, they, two of them came to me and said, where are you going? I said, what kind of a question is that? They said, where are you going? I said, no, but if I, I didn't know where I was going, I would have come to you to ask for directions. <laughs> Then they said, no, we are just doing our job. Then I said, no, nah, I'm also doing our, my job. I'm going to uh, work at the office. And then they said they wanted my student card. I, I was at Rice University in Texas. I said, no, if you wanted my student card, that is one thing you should have asked first, not the question you asked. And it became a, a, a war of words. For the next 30 minutes, I waited there. I had enough time the whole day. So, <laughs> and I made an issue. At one point, I said, you know what? I am a South African, by the way. I'm not an African-American. I am a South African. I had a taste of apartheid. So I can't leave South Africa, come here, and experience apartheid in a different format. I'm not going to tolerate that. Yeah, then they realized it was a problem. Then they started apologizing, and they let me go. As I was leaving, I said, this is not over. And it was not over. When I arrived in my department, I did what I was doing. Then I contacted one of my supervisors and explained what happened. And I said, I'm not happy, and I'm not going to take it lying down. Luckily, my supervisor saw things through my eyes. And then we called their boss, and it became a big issue. And then the boss called me, apologizing. I said, yeah, I accept your apology, your apology but only in principle. I'll accept it in full once we have written a formal letter of apology. Oh, wow. Then to write a formal letter of apology, then I felt good. I had made my mark. <laughs> So the point I'm making here is that uh, normally we, we, we take things for granted and then if I had allowed that to happen, chances are another fellow African was going to face the same. So my understanding is that uh, if they were smart, they would have treated other blacks uh, differently after that particular uh, incident. Now understanding black intelligence uh, continued here, I'll, I'll just go through uh, some slides very quickly. One, in the past, the African intelligentsia was active and visible. And this is no longer the case. I've made that point. 
uh, it also opened uh, the minds of uh, the masses, encouraging them to stand up against uh, the dominant political elite. We have the dominant political elite represented by our politicians, and then we have the academic elite represented by the intelligentsia. So what the intelligentsia did then was to open the minds and the eyes of the masses and say, what is happening to you is not right. Uh, at independence in the 1960s, the agenda of the intelligentsia changed because one of the things that had happened was that we must fight for our freedom. That was achieved, there was freedom, but then they had to change the agenda and then fight other battles. It called for academic freedom and university autonomy. It said we are free now, we have our universities, but then the state is interfering. And then they, they call for academic freedom and university autonomy. And then uh, former President Habon Peggy uh, made this point, and I quote, In earlier uh, decades, the progressive African intelligentsia warned us about the threat uh, of the emergence and domination of this predatory elite. By predatory elite here, he meant the political elite. So basically, you are saying that uh, our intelligentsia, the earlier ones who were visible, who were active, they warned us about this and said, you should not allow your political elite to dominate your life because you know what is supposed to happen. Uh, what Foucault will call governmentality, where you agree to be governed, but then you must be governed in your own terms not the terms that are set by our politicians, who call themselves honorable members, even if they do nothing honorable. <laughs> and I made this point in Parliament in 2017. I had been asked to uh, present something in one of the portfolio committees. You know, just because someone was good at toy doing and then found a place uh, to Parliament, suddenly that person is a god of some sort. I reminded them, I said, no, honorable, uh, through your chair, honorable members, can you please uh, uh, go back memory lane and think that uh, some of us have struggled to be where we are. we to go to universities, we to forfeit certain privileges, and then we end what we have. Some of you got in here because we voted you in because some of you don't even have a fallback position. That's why you kill one another. And then the tone changed. Because I was saying that uh, if you are a politician, you must have something else. Otherwise, you are going to kill 50 people and you will still not get the position because you don't deserve it. I repeated that last year when I was uh, addressing the case at legislature. They invited me. I mean, I'm, uh, Professor Makanya, I, I'm a bad person to invite. Because the legislature had invited me but then one of the things I said to them was that, uh, honorable members, I'm a bit worried. Uh, KZ10 has become notorious for political killings. And do you know why you kill one another? And everybody was surprised. What is this guy going to say? I said, no, the reason why you kill one another is because you have lost a sense of direction. Uh, if you kill me because of this position, Professor Makanya will come in. You kill Professor Makanya, Professor Sesante comes in. A professor Kola comes in, professor, I mean, how many people are going to kill? We'll kill 20 people and we'll still not get the job. And then eventually we made a joke and then we made peace. So the role of the intelligentsia and intellectuals from a global perspective, then Antonio Gramsci, as I said, Prof. Makanya has done that. I'm not going to dwell much on that. The intellectual and the intelligentsia's individual skills are important, but it is their ability to attach a larger social significance uh, to their esoteric, uh, esoteric uh, professional skills that make them stand out. So, which goes back to the point I made earlier on. We can all be educated people, but then the intelligentsia has to stand out. And the reason why it stands out is because it does things differently from the so-called educated who don't contribute anything to society. I, I then make an example here with uh, Eastern Europe, socialist Eastern Europe. In socialist Eastern Europe, the intelligentsia refused to be co-opted by the socialist state. And therefore, they became the moral elite. They took a conscious deci decision. We are socialists as much as government is a socialist, but we are not going to be co-opted by government. The reason why they took that uh, particular stance was because they wanted to have a space where they could operate independently and then question things when they were happening. That is why they survived. And then, of course, as the concept uh, of morality changed, 
the intelligence in Eastern Europe adapted accordingly. They said what we defined as morality last year is no longer morality this year. So we've changed. So let us also adapt uh, accordingly. So if you call yourself a uh, part of the intelligentsia, but you are stuck to the, uh, I mean, to the past, chances are you will not survive. Because you will no longer have fresh ideas. You will keep saying this is how we've been doing it. As I was talking to Professor Koda, saying in some of our institutions we are having a serious problem. There are people who have been part of the furniture. You try to come up with ideas, they tell you this is how we've been doing it. I lost it in one meeting. I lost it in one meeting and I said, you know what, with due respect, you have normalized an abnormal situation. Because what we've been doing, we've been doing it consistently to the extent that to you this is the only thing and nothing else. And then, uh, of course, uh, eventually I explained myself and then they became my enemies and I didn't care because I already had enough. So the intelligentsia has been adaptive elsewhere. Then the question is, what about us in Africa? What about our intelligence? Why are we not adaptive if others in Eastern Europe adapted to the new situation? Now I ask the, the, this question coming towards the end. Why is the African intelligentsia not as active as it should be? Here I'll just uh, highlight a few points. But before I do that, firstly, I would be, it would be an exaggeration uh, to assert that the role of the African intelligentsia has been totally eroded. That would be wrong. We still have the intelligentsia, we still have a few who are vocal, we still have a few who have a vision, but the problem is they are too small in number. So let, let us not make a mistake and say there is no longer an intelligentsia in Africa. We do have the intelligentsia, but we need more. What has actually happened, as I say here, is that the intelligentsia as a social class has become less visible than it used to be in the past. That's the problem we have. So we can still work with that. And then I quote here uh, AO and SEN, uh, who make the point that uh, the intelligentsia in the past and present had labored to ensure the unity of Africa. It has also labored and is still laboring through series of researches to identify, expose, and stop what will hinder Africa's development. So they've done something, they are continuing to do it, but then it's, it's not enough. That's the point. Now, the challenge is that uh, the number of uh, the intelligentsia uh, that is uh, still active is very low. Uh, to the, uh, uh, to be, it's very low to be noticed. And then the big question is why this is the case. And then to answer this question as I sit down, I will list a couple of those points. And there are 10 of them. One, co-option of the academic elite by, the political, by their political elite counterparts. And the point I make, I, I have the extended version of this uh, PowerPoint presentation where at some point I say that uh, our intelligentsia has been captured by the political elite for a number of reasons. Some of them uh, is because they have nothing to offer. I mean, if you don't conduct research, for example, and you are sticking to your notes that, has become, that have become yellow because you've been using them for the past 10 years, I mean, you don't have any source of argument. And the political elite will pick that up and say, Baba, shut up, because you don't know what you're talking about. That is one reason. But the other reason, because of the tenderpreneurs, the academics were also tenderpreneurs. I want a tender, and then Comrade X. And by the way, uh, uh, Professor Ma uh, Makanya, there is something I don't understand. We have rewritten English in South Africa. And if you talk to a leader, you no longer say a leader, you say a leadership. <laughs> now, you find the intelligentsia singing that song, hey, leadership, leadership. Because our members of the intelligentsia also need that man. They need access to that man. Then they'll keep calling leadership, leadership. Hey, it's a problem. It's a problem. So that's one reason. The second one is a political immaturity and insecurity on the side of the political elite. And then political greed and economic greed and fear on the side of the academic elite. There are some members of the academic elite who want to say something, who know what to say, but they are just suffering from fear, as Professor Kora was saying here. It could be a different kind of fear, but they are fearful. No, I can't do this because uh, the leadership will kill me. So, and then they can't do anything. 
So that's the second reason. On the issue of political maturity, I cite a book by Van Onselen, which he published in 2014, uh, uh, where, where he talks about clever blacks, Jesus, and Gandhi. That's the title of the book. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's published in 2014. Clever blacks, Jesus, and Gandhi. Then you can go and read that book. So where we, we, we then talk about well, whenever uh, the intelligentsia uh, criticizes uh, the political elite, and then we are, we are called clever blacks because you are venturing in an area that is not meant for you. Then the third reason is lack of financial resources. This one is a problem. Most, if not all, of our institutions are struggling financially. Now, for as long as our institutions are not financially stable, forget about an active intelligence. Because if I personally, I as Peggy, uh, the university is giving me five rand, and then the leadership out there is offering me 20 rand, I obviously things will change. <laughs> That's the reality we are faced with. So the mere fact that our institutions are not financially stable, that is a threat uh, to our intelligence. Yeah. Then the fourth point is low research outputs. Because our, in, our, our intelligence yeah, is no longer producing enough in terms of research, then it means there is no fresh knowledge. There is no, fr no fresh ideas. Therefore, we cannot engage our political leadership uh, with our fresh ideas. We cannot contribute to society because we have nothing to work with. The fifth one is uh, marketization and commercialization of higher education institutions. Whenever institutions were, were established, you, be it the Italian ones, be it the African ones, uh, in, in places like uh, um, uh, uh, Tunisia, in places like Morocco, and uh, places like Egypt, the idea of an institution of a high learning was where there was going to be a space for debate, where issues were going to be uh, engaged on. You can't do that now because our institutions are run like businesses. Yeah. The moment you try to push ideas and say, let's come and debate, you say, okay, uh, how much are we going to get at the end of that debate? Because everything is about money, 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 and, and, and all, all the way through. So we have a problem. The sixth one is low salaries paid to academic staff. The moment you pay your academic staff very low salaries, forget about an active intelligence here. Because the leadership is providing money out there. <laughs> and also, uh, the other thing that happens is that you also have funding agencies that are not coming from South Africa. And they have their own agenda. In 2014, I presented a paper in Japan uh, in the uh, inaugural Asian uh, Conference of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences. One of the arguments I made there was that the reason why our academics in general in Africa are not operating the way they should is partly because of the low salaries. They then end up taking other peace jobs outside academic institutions just to supplement their salaries. Now, where is time for intelligence to be promoted? None. Because it's a reality they're faced with. They have bills to pay. Uh, this intelligence work sometimes cannot pay bills. You go there, discuss Fanon from sunrise to sunset, at the end of the day, you have a bill to pay. This becomes a problem. The seventh one is heavy workloads. This is as a result of uh, our institutions not paying well and the private sector paying better. Then most of our good academics are leaving academic institutions and they are going to the private sector. The few that are remaining in the system are faced with heavy workloads. I mean, if you teach three modules and teach them well, tell me at the end of the day if you'll still survive and have time for critical thinking, which is what intelligence is all about. We won't have time for that. We are, we are just exhausted. You won't have time for that. Then the eighth one is a shortage of Africanist scholars in leadership positions. If by Africanist uh, scholars, I don't mean black leaders, because you have, uh, uh, which is my next point, you have uh, black and African leaders who have an identity crisis, which is my next point there. <laughs> they can't tell whether they are black or white. <laughs> and it's a reality. What happens in that case is that you will find someone who's black like me, uh, basically uh, ululating whenever a Westerner makes a point. Yeah. When I make the same point, it's shut down. Yeah. That's the reality. Now, for as long as we don't have African scholars, look at our masters and PhD dissertations. How many of them are grounded on Ubuntu? 
ask yourself of the number of students you have supervised, how many of them are using Ubuntu as the grounding force? How many of them are using Afrocentricity and Afrocentrism as the grounding force? But if a student comes with the realism, liberalism, <laughs> Marxism, yeah, yeah, this is good, this is good. <laughs> Why is it the case? Uh, I teach uh, uh, international relations theory. And my students like me, and my classes are packed. Even students who are not registered in my department, they come for those modules. Because the first two, three weeks, I forget about Europe at all. I talk about African approach to thinking. And then by the time we talk about your liberalism, your, your structural, whatever else, you, you are then using it against what you already know about Africa. This should be our point uh, of departure. I'm almost there. Then the last one is Miss interpretation of globalization. People work under the impression that globalization is a new phenomenon. That's a lie. Globalization has been there in the pre-colonial era. What has changed is that we have made this a buzzword. And there are people who talk about globalization even if they don't know what it means. And then whenever the intelligentsia is failing to perform at the level they are supposed to, they then say, yeah, no, we can no longer push the African agenda because we are now in a global world. The world has become a global village. No, no, no. If there is time for Africanization to take center stage, it is now. Because under globalization, you are basically saying, let everyone bring his or her ideas on the table and let us engage. What are you going to engage with if you don't know yourself? You have an identity crisis. You have no contribution to make. Then the last bit is on the way forward. Here, I make just a few suggestions. One, there is a need for a change of mindset by both our academic elite and the political elite. Secondly, there is a need uh, to invest in African-focused research before going abroad. I'm not saying that uh, Western ideas are bad, by the way. I'm saying that use Africa as a point of departure, even when we discuss our research agenda. And then third, uh, the intelligentsia should refrain from hiding behind globalization due to their misreading of what it means. And therefore, say, we can no longer uh, promote Africa. And the notion of African solutions to African problems should be embraced and be implemented. I have just published a piece where I was revisiting uh, this particular uh, uh, notion and looking at why it has failed. And I also, in another piece, uh, uh, tried to go back to the Pan-African Parliament, why it has been dysfunctional. I don't blame the West, I blame African, African leaders. For Africanization to succeed, the youth must be brought on board. Otherwise, we'll be fighting a losing battle. The youth is the future of the country, and we cannot leave them behind. And then I cite um, former President Tawompegi here, uh, saying that uh, the youth uh, consti uh, constitute an important uh, addition uh, to the intelligentsia of our continent. So it's for this reason that we need the youth. And therefore, we should take a cue, a cue uh, from Amilcar Cabral, who uh, uh, wrote a party manifesto, and amongst other things, he said the following, and I quote, hide nothing from the masses uh, of the people, tell no lies, expose lies whenever they are, uh, they, they are told, mask no difficulties, mistakes, fail, uh, and failures, claim no easy victories. This was Amerika Cabral uh, basically talking to his fellow politicians, warning them against being inactive and being invisible. And if we made this to the politicians, then what about us as the intelligentsia? In conclusion, the history of the black intelligentsia has deep roots, as we have seen. In the past, the intelligentsia was visible and active. And over time, the intelligentsia has lost focus and mingled with the masses instead of identifying itself as a special group in society. Consequently, it does not constitute an elite group as it's supposed to be. And then, of course, the factors enumerated above uh, as impediments uh, to an active intelligentsia should sound a warning uh, to all of us. Then it is clear that uh, there is lack of trust between the political elite and, of course, the academic elite. And to paraphrase Einstein, an intelligentsia that looks on as a society derails is worse than the political elite who lead society astray.
Thank you very much. Um, we have an interesting um, dilemma, time and the interest that we have got. Therefore, let me open up the podium and um, remind you that um, we don't only have the last speaker to respond to, but also there was a first speaker who spoke about um, issues of fear, violence, and enactment in our society. Before I open up the thing, I'll take a first round of questions by raising. Okay. I'll do this one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. In that order. My name is Kanye um, I have a question for um, two lectures. Uh, the first question is for Pum, uh, Professor Pumba, or Lack, if I pronounce it correctly. It's relating to um, the scale of gender based violence in universities. Um, in my own understanding, as I was doing a bit of the research, um, the universities <coughs> themselves, as well as the Department of Higher Education, it looks like they do not have the actual statistics as to how many cases of gender-based violence, sexual harassment, and so on happens in universities. So um, I just have a question that, as a person who's involved um, within the academic space, what do you think has to be done in order to ensure that all those cases are recorded and know that how many cases are happening in the universities? Then um, moving on to um, Professor Ngome Zulu, my, 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 my concern that I want to raise is that you have um, Define for us um, what you call 
leg into the gym chair. But um, my, my first concern is that um, there is some sort of um, um, uh, how academics conduct their research and publish their papers. The first thing is what I call um, uh, knowledge appropriation. Um, we find that an academic, um, I'm Zulu, but I find myself wanting to publish a paper about how Kosar and their culture and so on. So um, my, my question is based on that. And secondly, um, uh, we remember the Fish and Small movement that happened in, in, in South Africa, uh, as, as well as um, the colonization of education system. Many black academics, they distanced themselves from that court at the time, and they were not available to, um, to have a conversation and converse with the student. In fact, they colluded with the universities to ensure that students are singled out and face serious repercussions. But today, we see those academics are publishing papers saying they are to colonial scholars. So, um, in, 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 in terms of your the black academic academia, okay, sorry, could you please explain to me uh, what is your take on, on what I call a, a, a knowledge appropriation? Actually, dealt with fear. If he did, 
Y can be in the same. We also know of um, the, the, the young Salome girls who were under input of Ibuke, who were to what to actually make uh, a certain uh, um, arrangement of, of the elders. They refused. Yes, they were bloodshed, but that was the last time that Bishop to my story uh, you know, was done. So, of course, you need to understand as an intelligentsia, you might actually sacrifice the freedom of living your life when you start taking things at all. But we do have those examples. But I, I don't think we do actually take from those lessons that uh, we know from the past. There are some nice uh, books that were published that, mm -hmm. in a way, were actually addressing this inherent fear. There's a book, uh, I think it was written by somebody in the of Bella, which says, where a girl actually went against his father's wish to marry a person that his father thought was, uh, was not rich or was not that useful. And then there was another one, so I can't remember who wrote that one. Excuse me, sorry sir, I think uh, your going over a minute has been, but can we stop there and then uh, I'm going to ask now, I'm stopping also the questions, I'm going to ask now the individuals uh, that you have asked the question, at least we have the benefit of that, and if we have time then I'll take another round. Thank you so much. No, I think for you it's over. <coughs> Uh, can I ask uh, Prof. Gola and uh, Prof. Gomezu to answer the questions from where they are? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. I think they are interlinked in a way. And uh, there is nothing wrong uh, with uh, the questions and also with the context in which they were asked. Starting with uh, uh, of course, you, you talk about knowledge appropriation. And that is in line with what I was trying to say, that uh, it would be unwise, in fact, it would be foolhardy uh, to try and appropriate Western knowledge when I don't understand my own knowledge. So my point of departure on the Africanization agenda is that uh, in terms of knowledge appropriation, I must start from where I understand things better. And then once I understand that, then I go outside to then do comparison. Because then, if I just start by appropriating knowledge uh, produced elsewhere, you will remind me of uh, 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 the former president of Uganda, uh, Milton Obote, who complained that he almost failed his exams that were set uh, in England. Because they were talking about double deals in the exam. And he had no clue what it was. But if they had set the exam using examples from Uganda, then we have understood what it meant. So knowledge appropriation then basically is not uh, basically a challenging Africanization. The two are in sync, in that for you to appropriate knowledge, you must have a base. And my argument is that base must be African, an African base, not a European base. Then we'll understand whatever other forms uh, later. Uh, the absence of uh, black intelligentsia in hashtag Christmas form is regrettable. It comes back to the point I was making that we have the intelligentsia, but the intelligentsia is invisible and inactive. But there's also an interesting point there, because uh, when the media took this issue and made it public, the main thing they were focusing on was that for the first time, you have an active white number of students who are participating. Then the question for me was, does this have anything to do with race? But then when we debated it, those I debated it with, they were saying that uh, most of the time when there, was, when there are strikes, it's only led by black people. Now that we are talking about hashtag Christmas call, we have a few whites coming in and then suddenly they see the media. But this is a debate for another day. Now, uh, this issue of re-Africanizing and de-Africanizing, we are spot on. Not everything African is good, and not everything African is bad. The reason why some of us have been arguing that the history books in South Africa need to be rewritten is exactly for that reason. Mm -hmm. I argued was talking to one of the ministers saying that uh, South Africa did not have South African history, by the way. We had white history in Africa. 
And then I was arguing that uh, if we were to have an uh, African history, then we have to do things differently. And then I made proposals as to how that would be done. So we are absolutely right. We have to de Africanize and re Africanize just for all. I can't uh, disagree with you. Standing up is because I was apparently the the sound isn't picking up wasn't picking up. Um, okay, let me be brief. I'm gonna start with the last question because I want to. Okay, let me just do it this way. So the last question, the last question was the part of it that was meant for me anyway. Um, you know, I don't think that. Courage is something that happens in the absence of fear. Um, and so when we present questions, when we present examples of people behaving courageously, even though they know what the consequences are, that's not necessarily the absence of fear. And so I think that, you know, I think the examples of, at the same time, so that's one thing, and I'm talking specifically now about how I talked about fear as a, as a social political construct and not when we're talking about fear as an emotion. I mean, as, as a, as a, as a, as a, of course it's, it's, it's for control, but I was speaking about fear specifically in terms, and in terms of how it's been used in the enshrinement of specific kinds of power. So yes, of course, there are volumes of work written on fear. Um, I write on fear, I teach on fear, I'm, 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 I'm and, and, and of course those volumes um, are different archives of African scholarship. Um, so, Yes, I mean, I think that I, 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 I agree there needs to be um, ongoing engagement with different traditions and different uses historically of, 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 of fear. I, I, I would have thought that that would have been um, evident, but I'll, 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 I'll see. Um, and then, Ganyi, so you asked two very difficult questions. I think that, I think the question you asked about, uh, which you actually asked to Biggie, not me, but I'll answer it anyway. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. It was very striking um, how many of us were, came out in support of, of, of um, the decolonial and, and, and fallist movements of students. Um, I think that's both, you know what? I think that's both regrettable and fine. But that's the benefit of hindsight. I'm not sure when we, when very few of us came out in support of, of, of Rose Must Fall publicly and came out in, 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 in how very, very few South African black academics did so, um, and, 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 and later Fees Must Fall, and some of us put our bodies on the line. Um, I wasn't as willing to be as generous in, 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 in that point about, you know, maybe it's fine, right? But in retrospect, I think, you know what, maybe Taking positions does not mean we all have to agree. Maybe it's fine, maybe it's possible to have an African intellectual progressive location and not necessarily agree with every single other aspect of every African location. But you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling kind today. Um, as I said, at a different point, I was, I, was, I was much angrier. And this links to what I thought you were saying about the appropriation, so how the, op the opportunism really there. So how do people, who were opposed to decolonial challenge to them, to the institutions that we occupy, then sometimes become the people who are writing the five million um, funding proposals for decolonial. And I'm not talking about UNISA, who actually had decolonial summer schools even prior to the explosion of decolonial in the rest of the academy, right? But how do people subsequent to that who, who in well, it's an important question, and I think it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a question that we that we need to confront in in in, 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 in different ways, and, and, and so I think it's an ongoing conversation. But I think you're absolutely right; it is a conversation that needs to be part of 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 how disruptive, revolutionary thinking gets co-opted. Yeah. And Spivak, Gayatri Spivak. Is, is incredibly instructive on this, as is Edward Said. I mean, they both have written substantially on exactly how radical, and Spivak says, the same, that's how the center survives. It survives by taking, superficially, taking bits of, the most, of its most radical critique 
and using it to mask itself and so that it looks like it's, it's, it's actually taking on that radical critique. But it's both part of silencing that radical critique and allowing the center to survive unchanged. So thank you very much for that question. It's a very important question. <laughs> the other question is much harder about TBV at universities and how we get the right, um, how we get it right. I mean, I think that um, I'm going to say in character, the unfashionable. One of the problems with universities is that sexual violence is part of the institutional culture. It's part of the institutional culture of universities. But we want to treat it as though it's a strange, deviant thing that happens that we can somehow deal with. But it's part of the, it's in the very fabric of institutional culture. And I'm afraid until we start to treat it as seriously as we treat other things that we think are a problem in institutional culture, we just, we're fixing small scale problems. And I think one of those problems, one of the things, one of, one of the ways that we can shift that is, and in terms of kind of proper reporting, is that we need to move away from what we always do with sexual violence, which is to say, which is to kind of respond to individual things and then hold them up. Okay, so sexual violence is, 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 institu is part of institutional culture, but you know what? We're gonna brag very much about the two cases that we got right, right? So we, not, we need to treat it as, as, as a systematic problem and not a moment by moment by moment, which, you know, we, 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 that's one of the problems. And I think, I don't know, we, so we have some stats, but as we, say, as we know with sexual violence, um, everywhere, not just in the academy, the, the stats are severe, the severe underreporting. But we're not going to have proper reporting in institutions that discourage it, right? So institution that is, in our institution, like I said, sexual violence is institutionalized, but we somehow expect people who suffer sexual violence to act as though they're not socialized into institutions that, 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 that. so, and, 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 and why should people report? In institutions that punish them for, for, for in, in, in institutions that normalize sexual violence, why should people report? Because they know for a fact what the, 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 the response will be more violence. So we're not going to get the proper stats until we stop lying to ourselves about how central sexual violence is to our universities. It is in the fabric of our institutional culture. Um, we can try various kinds of things, but we're not going to get the reporting. And perhaps we can. And, and, and those things need to be about shifting, about denaturalizing um, 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 sexual violence in, 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 in universities and also institutionalizing the, the ways to counter sexual violence. So don't put it in some corner where it's juniorized or it's in a corner somewhere. Give it the visible institutional power. Um, keep it on the agenda, have it as a standing agenda item on, 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 in the committees that matter, have the specific machinery for it, um, for dealing with sexual violence. You know, so, so it's a whole range of things, but, but none of those things are going to work if they're exceptionalized. And the problem is that currently we constantly exceptionalize. Um, Ms. Musundu. Um, What is the intellectual response to the female fear factory? I think the institutional response is, is precisely what you say. I know you asked me the question, but in asking me the question, you provided some of the answers, I think. Um, and of course, I recognize that we don't have the complete answers, right? But, 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 but part of doing that work is talking about, because, because I, it's not, Part of the intellectual response is to name what you're naming. Part of the intellectual response is, is, is by doing the work of, of, of discomforting this whole room in saying what you're saying and saying hopefully what I'm saying, right? Because part of how it remains a, such an ingrained part of the institution, not just this institution, but all academic institutions in this country and elsewhere, um, is precisely because of the silence, because of the pretense, because of the pretense that, oh well, you know, you're a head of department, you're academic, you don't have to suffer it, you don't have to deal with sexual violence, you don't have to deal with constant 
threats of, of, of violence. You don't have, you, 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 we enter universities and suddenly we de-women ourselves. <laughs> Except this is not a reality. But also, of course, I mean, we have to think about other ways in which the academy, and this is not the work of the people who have to deal and think about sexual violence all the time. It's the work of the people who can afford to think that sexual violence is not happening all the time at university. So if you are that person who doesn't think about it all the time, who doesn't have to think about getting into a lift, who doesn't have to think about um, how people address you on email and so on, you are the person who's supposed to think about the ways then in which you are the person who's supposed to think more about how sexual violence um, continues to be part of. And then one last thing, sorry, I just briefly left my, lost my train of thought. Um, there was something really important you said and I'm going to kick myself if I don't. Oh, I forgot that. I'm sorry. Next time I come to UNISA, that's what I'll leave with, regardless of what I'm talking about. I'll be talking about cars, I'll be like, wait, last time I was here. <laughs> Colleagues, um, let uh, me request Professor Zungu, and sorry to all the other ones that I've recognized because of the time issues. And Professor Zungu, can you close the session? Program Director, thank you so much. Before I close, I would like to thank our esteemed speakers for sharing such a valuable information and knowledge with us. And as we do it in our institution, we do it in style. I would like to call upon you to come and receive a small token of appreciation. Professor Gola first. Did she say small? It is. <laughs> Professor Lagala, please come through. Colleagues, in the interest of time, program director, please allow me to pass a vote of thanks and appreciation on behalf of our vice principal, of our vice chancellor and principal. Uh, I would like to extend a warm and sincere appreciation for gracing us with your presence today. I particularly would like to acknowledge everyone from the members of council in the governance structure. Um, to enable us, such as the departments that were involved in actually making sure that the event was a success. Uh, my vote of thanks for today does also extend to the previous series of lectures that we have had, given that it is the last lecture for 2019. We have come to the end. It's a bittersweet, but it has to end. Since your appreciation to all individuals and departments that made various contributions to us making each AIP event a great success, um, finally, in no small measure, I must acknowledge the catering company that provide food and refreshments of the best quality during each keynote lectures and addresses. I'm particularly mentioning this because their contribution is that amount to the food for thought given by all the lectures, keynote speakers, and the respondents to the keynote uh, speakers. Having said all the, the niceties, allow me, as the person who was involved in the project this year, to take the latitude to acknowledge your great contribution as an interactive audience to the African Intellectual Project, which was initiated by our Vice Chancellor. In a university that prides itself as an African university shaping futures in service of humanity, this African Intellectuals Project took a bold step to find the African solutions for African problems as it sought the very best of our intellectual vanguard to act, to profess, to reflect on the scheme of things as an Africa-centered brains trust, extending the vision which was shared by Du Bois, who believed in the, sort, in the thought leadership by a talented 10th. This project invited prominent and relevant intellectuals 
to come and present their ideas to the UNISA community in a form of keynote addresses. In the interest of time, I would like to say in retrospect, ladies and gentlemen, considering all the keynote addresses that we have had, including the ones that we had today, the prominent people who gave them, one can safely say that the African Intellectual Project had a successful run this year. In the heavenly expression of our African language, we say, That said, the wonderful challenge that we face going forward, it lies in the question as to how we build on and continue on this successful trajectory of the project in the years to come. Residing as the project does in the Vice Chancellor's office, it remains to be seen how all the pearls of wisdom from the keynote addresses will find concrete expression in the review of our strategy 2030, in the realignment of business plans across all operational units of UNISA, and in the transformation initiatives of the leadership and transparent department, uh, in the leadership and transformation department going forward. On that note, on behalf of our VC, I would like to sincerely thank you for supporting us throughout the series of the, pro of the program or of the, of the project. Till 2020, lunch is saved. We kindly request that members of the Diplomatic Corp join the VC on the third floor in at Mpebato restaurants. Otherwise, for the rest of us, lunch will be saved at the foyer. Thank you so much. Thank you.